So this is chapter 15, Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. Before we get started, really look at the images I put here, um, particularly the political cartoons or and or um, lithographs or sketches. You'll see here these civil rights bills, um, equality. You see, you look at the bill with the government and the people. Um, Part of the problem is these civil rights bills we're going to find are going to have no teeth and there's going to be a lot more, a more tougher action taken with constitutional amendments. And even then, those amendments um, will not be um, very effective. So let's get started. So there's a couple of questions that Reconstruction we need to answer. First, how should the South be readmitted? The former Confederate states needed to be readmitted to the Union. They weren't just going to say, hey guys, let's uh, come back together. Um, there needed to be a process because they did succeed, which many, you can look at, was not legal. There was nothing in the Constitution that gave succession. So how are they going to become part of the country again, these succeeding states? And then next, how should or should the leaders be punished? How should that happen? Um, there's going to be big disagreement. Congress is going to want to severely punish uh, the leaders, even Andrew Johnson to a point. And then Abraham Lincoln um, would wanted to be much more kind, believing it would bring the country together uh, much uh, better. So the presidential approaches from Abraham Lincoln to Andrew Johnson um, Abe Lincoln and Andrew Johnson had similar plans. Um, they both wanted to give amnesty or pardon most Confederates, uh, but the Confederate leaders would be a little bit different. They also both agreed, um, with the two presidents, um, Lincoln and then his successor after his assassination, Andrew Johnson, that states could be readmitted once 10% of the voters who voted in the 1860 election pledged loyalty to the United States and where that state legislature or and or the overall uh, state convention would have to vote to ratify and accept the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which made slavery illegal in the United States, abolished slavery. So, for example, 10% of the voters say in 1860, 50,000 people voted in Arkansas. So with the 10% rule, or the 10% plan, 5,000 of those folks would have to pledge loyalty to the United States. Then, that state legislature or the convention to be readmitted to the Union would have to also vote to ratify the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. The Wade Davis bill was passed by Congress and it's going to show a whole different deal. They wanted 50% of those folks that voted in 1860 in that state to pledge loyalty. That would mean 25,000 out of the 50,000 that voted. Again, these are fictitious numbers. I just off the top of my head would have to vote. So it's five times more. It's much, much more steep. Lincoln is like, wow, that, that's, that's a lot. Um, and Lincoln pocket vetoed it. And part of his thinking was, did half of the people in those states really, were they really into that civil war or not? Were they really, really into that succession? Was it more of the top 10, maybe 15% that really drove the whole thing? And that was part of it. So... Uh, the, he just thought the 50% was too much. Now, just to remember, what is a pocket veto? Congress passes it, goes out of session. Lincoln doesn't sign it. The whole idea, he just put it in his pocket, forgot about it, wouldn't sign it. Because if it doesn't get signed and um, Congress uh, leaves um, within 10, uh, 10 days, um, if, he, if he doesn't sign it, it doesn't become law. Congress stepped in to take control of Reconstruction when first the South passed these black codes, or laws that restricted the rights of free blacks. So Congress would be like, mm, no. Secondly, Georgia will elect 
former Vice President of the Confederate States of America, Alexander Stevens, to the United States Senate. There's a real problem about, okay, Confederates, that's fine, being readmitted, loyalty, but Confederate leaders, especially the Vice President, and Stevens was pretty hardcore. He was much more of the firebrand compared to Jefferson Davis. Yeah, Jefferson Davis was the president, but um, Alexander Stevens was the pit bull. So, in Congress, they're like, uh, nope. So, we're going to take control of this reconstruction thing because we're not going to see Alexander Stevens. No thanks. So, it's going to be the Congress versus the president. And the president, for the most part, because unfortunately, uh, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, it's going to be a Republican Congress versus a former Democrat president, Andrew Johnson. Remember that Lincoln ran on a union ticket in 1864. It wasn't a Republican Party ticket. It was a union ticket. Abraham Lincoln, the Republican, and Andrew Johnson, the Southern Democrat from Tennessee, who did not succeed, never left Washington, and stayed in the Senate because he did not support succession. So it was a union ticket. So when Lincoln moved on and passed away his successor was a democrat so right there there's gonna be a lot of uh suspicion a lot of mistrust and a lot of disagreement so first was the freedmen's bureau it was created to provide food education and assistance to former slaves and poor whites you gotta understand guys all the suffering wasn't just slaves there were a lot of poor whites that were suffering just as much as if not more in some instances than the former slaves. It was a real problem with education and just being able to survive for many, many, many whites. Now, um, the other thing to keep in mind, the Freedmen's Bureau basically is the first federal government program that would give direct relief and services to citizens. Before, it was always states that did this. So there's a lot of controversy about the Freedmen's Bureau where, where members of Congress and people, uh, governors, particularly in the southern states, um, would say, look, um, you know, federal direct f- federal aid to people, that's probably unconstitutional. So it was controversial. What was its big success was education. Many of today's great uh, black colleges and black institutes of learning like Tuskegee and other places, uh, uh, these trade uh, schools, um, post high school trade schools, uh, were founded during this period of time. And through the assistance and through the the, the spirit and the influence of the Freedmen's Bureau in the South. Also, Congress will pass the Civil Rights Act of 1866. First, the 13th Amendment, okay, it abolished slavery. Okay, well, what about these freedmen, these former slaves? Okay, they're not slaves anymore. What about their citizenship and their equal protection under the law? Because the states in the South in particular um, were passing black codes. It's one of the reasons why the Civil Rights Act of 1866 came through, because these black codes would restrict blacks and make them Basically, well not basically, essentially second-class citizens. So they tried to write this with the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The problem was is that the states wouldn't enforce them, and the, uh, the government was taken to court, saying, well, you know, don't really have to do that. That's a violation of states' rights, that states are going to decide um, those types of questions um, rather than... Um, Especially the equal protection part, not necessarily the citizenship part, but the equal protection part. Um, so Congress was like, okay, well, now we're going to change the Constitution. So then the 14th Amendment will be, um, would be ratified, um, well, first will be proposed by Congress, and then eventually ratified by three quarters of the states. Remember, three quarters of the states then still were mostly northern states. There's a lot of the southern states still haven't readmitted. So it's pretty easy for them to get the three quarters of the states. 
So remember how a, a, a um, constitutional amendment happens. Um, the way it's always been done is two thirds of both the House and Senate would propose a, an amendment to the Constitution. Then it'll be brought to the states, and then the states would either through their legislature or by electing a uh, convention would look and debate this and then decide to vote for ratification. Three quarters of the states would have to ratify. Notice the president isn't involved because Andrew Johnson played games with the civil rights of 1866 and other things. So Congress said, look, we have the two-thirds votes in both houses of Republicans. Let's put it up there and let's get this um, as a constitutional amendment. And it made this act of 1866 permanent. Again, the two things, citizenships for all blacks. That means regardless of your race and previous condition of servitude, that means being a former slave. Your citizenship can't be denied. And second, have an equal protection under the laws. That black codes can't exist. You can't have laws that make people second-class citizens. That would not be equal protection under the law. I know I'm going over this quite a bit, but we're going to see this later on um, with civil rights. And you need to understand the legal basis of the civil rights amendments. The 13th, 14th, and we'll get to later the 15th Amendment. So these radical Republicans, okay, that were growing in numbers in the 1860s after the Civil War, led in the Senate by Thaddeus Stevens of Massachusetts, excuse me, let me back up, led by Charles Sumner in the Senate from Massachusetts, and then led by Congressman Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania in the House of Representatives. If any of you ever saw the uh, film um, of Lincoln, um, uh, Thaddeus Stevens was a main character in in the film, pushing. He was actually over dramatized, pushing um, the the ratification of the Thirteenth Amendment, where he made himself look more moderate. Um, good film, good uh, portrayal of Thaddeus Stevens. He's on the left, the bottom uh, the bottom left, and and the uh, the right is um, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts. So we're going to look at some vi visuals here that has to do with the Freedmen's Bureau. First, we're going to look at a cartoon. Obviously, look at pretty racist, uh, where it says "plenty to eat and nothing to do." Um, this whole stereotype that African Americans don't do anything, that whole lazy stereotype, and some really bad stuff. And you look at this uh, this uh, image here, the popular idea of the Freedmen's Bureau: Bureau, plenty to eat and nothing to do. So in other words, you're wasting all this time, giving all this food and all that stuff um, for African Americans who don't have anything to do. So here's a Freedmen's Bureau school. And again, when we're going through these guys, I'm going to go through them a little bit quick, but you can always pause to look at these photographs more. And also pause if you want to take more notes, more in depth. That's what's great about making these videos. You can go at your pace. Here's another Freedman school from the outside, freed from slavery. Blacks of all ages filled the schools to seek educations that have been denied to them in bondage. Their education often costs one tenth of each month's wages. And you look originally, look here, the teacher is white. Eventually, these teachers that will be trained will be African American. But early on, um, there would be uh, teachers that would come from the north. Um, to get these schools started. The goal was is to have um, black teachers. Here's an inside another of a Freedmen's Bureau school. Nice little, uh, not little, uh, big stove in the middle to keep everybody warm. And another Freedmen's Bureau school. Looks like church pews. Well, not really, benches. Interesting. A lot of education back then it wasn't always a lot of writing. It was a lot of oral um, reading from the board and repeating things and memorizing things that way. Old school, real old school. So we'll look at President Andrew Johnson. He remained loyal to the Union during the Civil War. He was a senator from Tennessee and never left the Senate. He re rejected succession and stayed in Washington during the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln chose him as his vice president to help win the South's uh, Reconstruction and also to help him win the election. 
because there was a real concern of Southern Democrats, I mean, excuse me, Northern Democrats that were still in the Union, known as not necessarily Copperheads, but their leaders were. Um, he wanted to get as many Democrats as possible. He wanted a Union ticket. He was afraid uh, that General George McClellan, his um, uh, Democratic opponent, was going to win. Um, and up until probably mid-September of 1864. So instead of being a Republican, it was a Union ticket. And they were able to uh, do well because of that. He supported Lincoln's plan for the most part. He wanted to be a little bit more harsh on the, uh, the, the elite planters. He had a real problem from Tennessee. He didn't like the really super, super rich uh, plantation owners. He had a personal grudge against them. He engaged in a power struggle with Congress over who would lead the country through Reconstruction, and Johnson will lose this. So radical Reconstruction. What was that? The heart of the radical Reconstruction movement, which became the law, is the Reconstruction Act of 1867. And what it essentially did was divide the South into five districts. I should have that map up there. I know the map is in the book. We will look at it in class just to really quick what it is. And each district was um, led by a district governor or commander. It was a general in the army. It was a military commander. So these districts were treated as five military controlled districts. They were treated as conquered foes. So it's very, um, let's just say, lack of a better term, from, from a white Southerner's standpoint, very oppressive and heavy-handed, military control, forcing compliance with Reconstruction. States must provide suffrage for blacks. Suffrage means the right to vote and deny it to ex-Confederates. Think about that for a second. If you're a former Confederate, you're, you lost in the Civil War. Your state has been ravaged. And look at that. Blacks can vote, former slaves. But your leaders, your political leaders, your Confederate leaders can't. That's harsh. I'm not saying it's wrong. But from the standpoint of a white Southerner, that's very harsh. And will cause a lot of white Southerners to be very bitter with troops amongst them and their leaders not being allowed to vote, but former slaves who they believe they're superior to can. Also, the, uh, under radical reconstruction, because the radical Republicans are going to overwhelmingly control the House and Senate, they're going to have veto-proof supermajorities. That means more than two-thirds majority in each chamber. And because Andrew Johnson is going to upset all Republicans, not just the radicals, your conservative or liberal Republicans are also going to unite with radical Reconstruction and the radicals that run Congress because Johnson's going to actually make them so angry it's going to unite all the Republicans. And eventually that's going to lead to Johnson's impeachment. And what are they going to do to basically bait him to impeachment is they're going to pass a law called the Tenure of Office Act. And Johnson is going to happily violate it. What was the Tenure of Office Act? It stated that the president must get consent of the Senate before removing cabinet members. Now, as you know, in the Constitution... The Senate gives advice and consent to presidential cabinet appointments. Secretary of State, Secretary of War, Attorney General, Postmaster General. The Senate must vote in the affirmative, a majority, to consent, agree to that appointment. It says nothing in the Constitution about the president's right to fire and remove folks. The risk is, if the president removes someone and then they nominate someone new, this is where the Congress can say, uh, guess what, We're not, you're not going to have a Secretary of State now. 
There's nothing in the Constitution that says the Senate must advise and consent on firings of presidential, removing of cabinet members or other officers. And you can make the argument, and I would, that the Tenure of Office Act is unconstitutional. The only way you could implement this is to have a constitutional amendment. I, I would agree with that from a legal standpoint. So Andrew Johnson's like, really? It's because they have all these majorities, they think they're going to do that. So what Johnson does, he fires Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Fires him. And that brings forth this violation of the Tenure of Office Act. And what they're going to do, the House of Representatives is going to put forth articles of impeachment. What is an impeachment? An indictment or charges put against a president or a judge. So in this case, we're looking at the president of the United States. The impeachment of the president is even different than impeachment of judges. So let's put judges aside right now. The House will vote to indict or vote to put charges against the president. The main charge on this was the Tenure of Office Act. They got him from a couple other things, obstruction of justice, who knows. They added a couple other charges to it. So the House of Representatives votes to impeach. That means charge him. When you're impeached, it does not mean you're guilty yet. does not mean you're removed from office. You've just been put up on charges. So therefore, when you're charged in our system, guys, charges are put against you. The next thing you do is you go to court. You go to a trial. Well, in the United States Constitution, for a political charge, these charges are tried in the United States Senate. So Johnson gets impeached by the House. They send it over to the Senate. Now the Senate now has to conduct a trial of the President of the United States of charges for violating the Tenure of Office Act and other things. So the Chief Justice of the United States is the presiding judge or the presiding judge of a impeachment trial the senators are the jury the senators must vote to impeach excuse me to convict the president however it's not a majority vote guys it's a two-thirds vote of the pre senators present to convict and the only punishment of conviction in an impeachment of a president is removal from office that is it. It is a political charge with a political trial and a political punishment. You need to understand that. If someone's impeached, it does not mean they've thrown an office. There's been two presidents that have been impeached. Andrew Johnson in 1868 and William Jefferson Clinton in 1998. Okay, Neither of them were convicted in the Senate. Andrew Johnson was not removed from office because he was not convicted. However, it was by one vote. They were one vote shy of conviction. And there's only one reason why it was one vote shy. The guy back then that would have become president was the president pro tem. The third in line from the president was the president pro tem. There was no second in line because the vice president was Andrew Johnson when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Johnson became president. There was no mechanism in the Constitution to appoint or get a new vice president. So the vice presidency was vacant. So therefore, I went to the third line. At that time, was the president pro tem. Who is the president pro tem of the Senate? Is the oldest, excuse me, the longest serving member of the majority party. I don't remember this guy's name, but he was old and pretty much senile, and from some senators thought he was crazy. So what happened is, guys, the Senate didn't think this out. The Republicans didn't fully think this out. If they would have removed Johnson from office, this almost senile, crazy guy, and if I show, I'm going to show you a picture in class. I don't have it here. You wouldn't have voted to impeach, or excuse me, convict Johnson of the impeachment at all. Okay, but here's the thing. He's impeached by the House in embarrassment. The first time a president's ever impeached. Secondly, he skates from being convicted by one vote. That's real close. Very embarrassing and very damaging to his power. 
So, all right, we don't remove him, but guess what? He has no power. We have super majorities in the House and Senate. There's absolutely no way this guy's going to be nominated for president again for re-election in 1868, which is basically that year, okay? So, the damage was done, okay? But Johnson was impeached, but not convicted and removed from office. The same with Bill Clinton. Now, Bill Clinton, when he went to the Senate trial, he was easily, easily not convicted. I don't even think a majority of the senators voted for conviction. And it was a Republican Senate, Bill Clinton being a Democrat. The other thing to remember brought up our impeachment trial. Who are the prosecutors? So you have a judge, you have a jury. Well, you have prosecutors that goes before the jury and makes the case why this individual should be convicted. Those are called house managers. They're members of the House of Representatives, usually from the Judiciary Committee, that push the articles of impeachment in the first place. These are the guys, at the time it was guys, or no girls in the, in the House, that actually knew the charges and the reasons why they were the experts on it. So they become the prosecutors. So it's a very unique thing, the trial of a president, an impeachment trial of a president. Chief Justice presides, the Senate is the uh, jury, and there are members of the House of Representatives. I can't remember the number. It depends on the size of the committee they put. They're called House Managers. They're the prosecutors. Again, it's all political. If you get convicted um, as a president in an impeachment trial, you don't go to jail. Because it's not, it's not a legal proceeding. It's a political proceeding. This is the way our federal government um, can um, dispose of, you know, those um, in the executive branch or in the judiciary that break the law. High crimes, misdemeanors, bribery, treason, that kind of stuff. Treason's another animal, but you know what I mean. So, continuing this struggle for national reconstruction... The election of 1868 is going to lead to the 15th Amendment. Um, in the election of 1868, who gets elected president? I don't have it on here, but you read it. It's going to be Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant is the hero of the Civil War amongst many, but he was finally the, the successful commander of Union troops that will defeat the great Robert E. Lee and the Confederates and caused his surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865. Grant was seen as this great general. He was. He was a very good quartermaster. He stuck to the plan. He kept the, them coming. He was able to basically beat Lee by attrition. A great general. We're going to find not so great of a president, but extremely, extremely popular. Remember, Presidents are elected by popular elections in all the states. Today, all 50 states have a popular election. And the majority, whoever wins the majority of votes, that means 50% plus one, gets all those electoral votes. So if you're a popular person, you're going, you're probably going to win regardless of some of the misgivings of the Grant administration. He's going to be elected two terms because of his popularity. Everybody knew who Grant was. What was the 15th Amendment to the Constitution stated that suffrage of voting rights could not be denied based on someone's race, their color, or previous condition of servitude, what servitude, their condition of being a slave. Okay? That is the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. This would help ensure Republican support in the South. Why? Because African Americans would be able to register and vote. And when they voted, they voted over 95% turnout. They didn't vote Democrat, guys. You're not going to see... Um, you're not going to see African Americans in any significant numbers voting for Democrats until the 1930s. You're talking 70 years. Black Americans are going to be overwhelmingly Republican into the mid-30s, 1930s. Um, some of our more famous um, pioneering civil rights uh, supporting black Americans of the uh, 20th century, the great Jackie Robinson, the first African American uh, to break the color barrier in the major leagues, was a lifelong Republican tradition. Martin Luther King Jr., was a registered 
Republican. Now, whereas his views being more towards the Democratic Party in actuality before his assassination, the answer is yes. But just to understand, today, African Americans vote overwhelmingly Democratic. There's starting to be a little bit of shift in that, which I still haven't completely figured out yet. But up until the 1930s, you were African American, you were Republican. You didn't trust those former white Confederate Democrats. And we we're going to see why, how how uh, Reconstruction and the failure of it plays out in these Redeemer governments. And when they go into place, um, those white Democrats in those southern states are going to institute Jim Crow laws and discrimination against African Americans. That's going to last for almost uh, 60, 70, uh, about even longer, 80 years. So you can understand uh, that dynamic. And remember this, guys. Parties are a brand name. What a Democrat was in the 1870s and what a Republican was then can be completely different now. Okay? Democrat and Republican are brand names and their views over the years because it's, it's, a, it's a coalition of factions and a coalition of different groups of folks with different interests that, you know, come together under a common theme or a common um, deal. So you need to understand that party labels are like brand names. You have facial tissue, you have Kleenex and Puffs, you have Democrats and Republicans. Um, those, those meanings to those brands can change over time. Women's suffrage will be denied during this time. And if you think about the politics, guys, um, you're talking some major, major, major electoral, political, and social change after the Civil War where the concept of A, slavery is illegal, B, former slaves have equality under the law, which is going to be messed with big time in the federal courts and in the southern states and all that. And then third, uh, those same former slaves have the right to vote. I mean, we all can agree today that those were all the right things to do and should have been for a long time, but put it in context, 1866, 1867, the end of the Civil War, um, or after the Civil War in Reconstruction, and you're looking at this in the southern state, those folks that used to be the slaves now can vote, but your leaders can't, to try to get that going in Reconstruction, but at the same time also make a monumental cultural change and have women vote at the same time probably isn't the best strategy. Most men oppose this women's suffrage. They believe they're separate spheres. You know, men, you know, go to work, do the business, and be involved in politics, and they take care of that part of the world, whereas women take care of, you know, this cult of domesticity. They take care of what goes on at the home and take care of the family. Extremely important. Um, and a lot of men, they weren't like misogynist or anti-women. Uh, Many men would consult their wives and their, their daughters and, and women that they respected on, you know, positions in politics. I'm not saying it's right that women have the right to vote. I'm just, just saying this whole idea of separate spheres. And the whole idea of separate spheres is going to be different too. That, well, giving someone of a different race the right to vote is different than gender. Because... There are gender roles, and gender roles were, lack of a better term, were traditional and defined. Men went to work, you know, provided for the family, were involved in public um, discourse, public service in terms of electoral politics and other things. Women more so were involved in the home, and when they got involved in serving people, be more um, helping others, that whole reform movement before the Civil War. Um, all the different reform movements that went on, abolitionism, that kind of stuff. Okay. The women's rights groups were split. Now, there were two women's rights groups with almost the same names. You had the American Woman Suffrage Associ Association, AWSAR. I'm not even going to try to pronounce an acronym, AUSA, but we won't say that. AWSA. Help to achieve suffrage after Reconstruction. and They wanted to achieve after the country was reconstructed. That means after African American men had the right to vote and had their suffrage, let's deal with Reconstruction and the problem of former slaves first 
before we start dealing with the issue of women's suffrage. That was the AWSA's position. Secretary of War Stanton feared that suffrage was not likely near. And Stanton, the reason he was involved in this is that um, uh, he, there was questions in terms of the military and, and there's a whole bunch of different issues um, that had to do with women's right to vote um, that, that, that he ended up becoming a leader of this because he was from, originally from Pennsylvania. Then you had the National Woman Suffrage Association, another group, the NAWSA. They advocated for basically doing it both at the same time. All right, we have an amendment for African American male suffrage. Well, let's put up an amendment right now for women's suffrage too. And you put your political hat on to try to do two mind boggling, not meant to be, I'm just trying to come up with words here. Very, very, very intense social change on two major levels at once is probably not sustainable for society. What the NAWSA was trying to push, in my opinion, was not politically smart. I thought the AWSA was much more smart. Let's figure out suffrage for African Americans and Reconstruction and help with that. Then we're going to have the know-how and the goodwill to get suffrage for women later on. I think in terms of what's possible, not exactly what my ideals tell me to at times. Sometimes it overcomes me, but you got to be practical in politics, guys. And I don't think the NAWSA was that practical. And guess what? Women's suffrage did not happen at the time of the passage of the 15th Amendment. So the AWSA was on the right track. The other thing during this time is the quest for land. And notice that the title above is the meaning of freedom. Are you really free if you don't own your own home or own your own land? Are you? If you rent from somebody, don't own your own stuff, are you truly free? Land is going to be essential to reconstruction of the South. Freedom for African Americans. If they can't own land, are they really free? You can have an argument about that. I mean, a lot of people are free people today and they rent apartments. They own assets. They have money. They own cars. Okay. I always like to say the, 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 the foundation of a free society, to me, is private property rights. The right to own property. That you have a right to do it. Without that, we're not free. That's my opinion. That's the way I look at freedom. Okay, So land is not only going to be important for that, but land is going to be important in the South because over 90% of the economy is relied upon agriculture. And to grow stuff, you need land. And back then, guys, you needed quite a bit. You didn't have all of the machines that will be coming 30 or 40 years later. Okay, So you needed a lot of land to yield crops that you need to be able to make money and survive. So many former Confederates gained land back with Johnson's amnesty plan. Let's talk about that for a second. I don't know if you remember that during the Civil War you had this whole 50 acres and a mule that were promised to African Americans. That you're going to get 50 acres of land and a mule so then you can be self-sufficient after you've been liberated after the South is defeated and the Civil War is over. Well, Johnson kind of... Um, didn't let that happen. And that land that was supposed to be promised for 50 acres and a mule actually went back in the hands of the former Confederates and white folks. So those African Americans, all the African Americans who were promised with the 50 acres and a mule, didn't get it. Okay? So that was a huge, big, broken promise. It wasn't a law that was passed. It was um, when uh, William Tecumseh Sherman and others went through the South, they promised this. So then African Americans would support this scorched earth kind of thing where, where the, uh, the Union troops were ripping through the South to try to defeat the South. Okay, So I'm just giving you a backdrop to this, that the Confederates got this land back because of Johnson's amnesty plan. And what it did, it, what Johnson did, he ignored this whole 50 acres and a mule thing. So it caused a real problem. You have a bunch of former slaves with no land now. 
They don't have any money. So how are they going to get land without money? That's why this whole 50 acres and a mule and land redistribution thing was trying to be pushed. But it didn't pass Congress. And uh, Johnson was doing everything to undo that. So. so freed slaves and northerners had conflicting goals. All right. Most congressmen believed that former slaves would work on these former plantations and not own their own land. Really. Freed slaves had another idea. They wanted to own their own land because, again, a lot of them were promised by the commanders on the ground in the war that whole 50 acres and a mule. You have your own land and you have a mule to help you, you know, till the soil, right? Without land, former slaves were left susceptible to rich landowners. Look, if you don't own anything, guys, and you need a job, who's going to hire you? Richer people, people with money, they own businesses, right? They own land. Uh, the other poor guy that doesn't have land isn't gonna really going to be able to help you, okay? So don't look at rich landowners as a bad thing. However, during Reconstruction, all this land was basically given back to the rich landowners, and this whole, there's a huge, huge problem here with these former slaves with nothing. So what's going to come through with this is going to be wage labor and sharecropping. Many former slaves had to work for their former slave owners since they had no land and they were paid wages, but they didn't own anything. Okay, now don't un misunderstand this. Not all the relationships between former slave and former slave owner was contentious or, you know, bad. Actually, there were former slaves that very gladly worked for their former slave owners on the plantations being paid for wages. So I just don't want you to think that this was always adversarial or something that didn't want to be done. However, for people to be totally free, if you believe this, is land ownership and owning your own businesses and things of that sort. So what came in too was a system called sharecropping. And why did this come to be? Because it was necessary. The landowners had land that needed to be cultivated to grow crops and make money, right? Well... The former slaves needed to do something to be able to feed themselves, their families, put a roof over their head, and earn their keep. So what was the system that was put together at the time? Sharecropping. So what would happen is, is that a former slave or a poor white would rent land and pay the landlord with the crops that they grow. Not only would they rent land on the sharecroppers, a lot of times the sharecropper... Uh, the landowner would also give them the tools. They had the tools and stuff for them to be able to uh, plant and, you know, till and harvest. The different um, types of agreements depending on um, the situation. If a drought or a poor farming hit, that means if you're a bad farmer or a drought hit, uh, you'd be in trouble as a tenant. Because you can't pay the rent when it eventually happens. Bye bye Not that that didn't always happen. There would be some landowners that would work with these folks. Okay, it was a drought. They're going to take a hit this year along with the, the, the tenants, okay? So it wasn't... you got to understand the relationship between a landlord and, and, a, and a tenant isn't always... If it, things are tough, things are tough. Both sides, they try to work stuff out. Understanding these sharecropping were agreements. They were contracts. They were not forced into these... Well, the kind of forced into because they, again... People needed to work and be self-sufficient. And people that owned land had to work their land. Also, another thing that happened was a crop lien. Okay, you get access to land, you either rent the land. Now you need tools or supplies. You're not going to get that from, from the landowner. Um, you go to a local store and you get credit. So you can get all the tools that you need and get them ordered. You need fertilizer, you need furniture, you need stuff for your home, blah, 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 blah. And how do you pay that back? You pay that back also um, in a rate that's very high, 50 to 60%. So you get 100 bucks worth of stuff, you pay back 150. Very, very high um, um, rates of paying back. So what it did is it usually led to debt for borrowers of these former slaves. A lot of these former slaves were in debt. And here's the problem. 
they didn't have any land as collateral. Today, guys, if we get in debt, you know, our parents, our grandparents, or ourselves, you know, the credit card kind of, this is here, this crop leans kind of like a credit card, gets a little bit too much. What do people do? They remortgage their house and pay it off. Well, if you don't own any land, and you're former slave, what do you do? So just to kind of understand the situation, but I want I don't want you to look at sharecroppers, all oh, these poor, you know, former slaves and poor this and that. It was just really rigged. And no, it was the situation of the time. Okay? You could, you know, you can slap around uh, uh President Johnson for, you know, reneging on this fifty acre and a mule thing. But at the same time, guys, you're looking at an economy of these former states. If you start taking all the land away from the people that invest in the land, you're gonna make the economy even worse too. In a free market system, there's going to be really rich people. There's going to be really poor people. It's just the way it works. If everybody was rich, that's not going to happen. Uh, if everybody's poor, that means basically the government runs everything. So you got to kind of think about these things. It's very easy to bag on the rich and feel bad for the real poor. But if you look at these arrangements here, they make sense. Also understand, you know, look at a 50%, 60% high rate. The reason the rates were so high, there was a good reason or good chance that a good percentage of those, that credit would default. That means the borrower would be able to pay back. So they had to have high rates so they don't lose money when they're putting up the credit. Does that make sense? That's, that's what it was based on. Continuing the meeting of freedom, these Republican governments in the South, let's look at the Union League. It was an organization for blacks and white Republicans to share political news and voting procedures for blacks. The Republicans wanted to make sure that newly suffraged black voters understood political news. Of course, the political news would be from a Republican perspective and wanted to make sure that they voted Republican. And knew how to vote. And with these union leagues, you're going to see over 95% African American turnout in the South. They are going to vote. And with that, they're going to elect African Americans as state representatives, state senators, constitutional officers in the states. Gov- I don't know about governor, but lieutenant governor and, you know, um, treasurer and all that kind of stuff. Comptrollers. Not only that... Um, you're going to have some members of Congress that are African American and some African American United States senators because of African Americans voting in these former Confederate states. So some other f- names, scalawags, not a very nice word. I think a scalawag is some sort of a, I don't know, I don't know if it's a lizard or a bug or whatever it is. Scalawag is a real, it, it's an insulting name. These were Southerners that favored Reconstruction. Okay, mostly for economic reasons. They had an economic interest to support Reconstruction. Okay? Some just supported Reconstruction because they thought it was the right thing to do. Some scholawags believed that slavery was always wrong and it needed to be rid of in the South in order to move on. So it wasn't just about people's wallets. It was also about you know some of these Southerners thought, hey, you know they won't say it too loud, but yeah, slavery's wrong. We've got to make sure it never comes back. Carpetbaggers were northerners that moved south during Reconstruction. And why did they move south? For economic gain. Well, there was need for doctors and lawyers and teachers. you got to understand, the south was completely devastated. Their institutions, everything. You didn't have most... Under the plantation system, the, remember those plantations were all self-sufficient. You didn't have a lot of cities. There was a need for doctors, lawyers, and teachers, okay, because of the devastation in the South. Well, these people were called carpetbaggers, and the reason is a lot of these people would move down. They literally would put all of their belongings in a carpet bag on a stick, and you see people walking with a stick and this like bulb. That was the carpet bag, okay. A lot of those teachers were whites that came to the South to teach at those Freedmen Bureau schools. But over time, those teachers would move on, and then the new teachers would be African Americans that were educated through those schools. 
a lot of those uh, new black colleges would have preparatory schools for teachers. Political opportunities for African Americans increased during Reconstruction, for sure. Robert Smalls was a former slave and Civil War hero. He became a congressman. Hiram Revels was the first African American senator. He was obviously back then, senators were appointed by the state legislature. They were not directly elected. That won't happen until 1913. So uh, the, the legislature in Mississippi was controlled by Republicans and African Americans. So therefore they elected an African American in the United States Senate. And symbolically to Jefferson Davis's former seat. He was in the Senate during succession. And he became the president of the Confederate States of America. So that was highly symbolic. So building black communities, black churches doubled as schools and meeting places. Church during the week is where the kids went to school. When we went to meet about political issues and all that stuff, at the church. If you want to go backwards, not backwards, but understand, still to this day, some of the most noted leaders, political leaders in the black community, are or were ministers. Clergyman. Martin Luther King was a pastor. The Reverend, he's not just Dr. Martin Luther King, he was a reverend of a church. Um, in, in the 20th century, Jesse Jackson, he's kind of went by the wayside because of scandal and all that. Again, a reverend and actually a confidant of Martin Luther King when he was young. Um, a lot of when you go on TV and you look at black leaders, okay, a lot of those leaders on those political shows are pastors. Extremely powerful, um, in a good way for the, for black communities. The church will become the community center for African American communities, because guess what? They weren't allowed to go to white schools. Okay, they were pushed out of the political process eventually. So where could they go to worship and speak freely and learn? Neighborhood church. Just think about the practicality of that. And black churches, even to this day, are extremely powerful in the African American community. Civil rights of 1875 wanted to um, ensure full and equal access to political accommodations. That would be the right to vote. Okay, to be able to work within um, the governments and make sure that their political rights were protected. The problem is with these civil rights acts, we're going to see that the Supreme Court and the federal courts will reinterpret these acts not to what they're intended. And because of that, the teeth or and or the power of these laws are going to be diminished significantly. There's a photograph there of some parishioners in front of their church, an African-American church. Or black church, excuse me. So Reconstruction is going to be undone. And you can look at this in a couple of ways. It's going to wane to decrease and become weaker. Reconstruction efforts will wane in the 1870s. But let me say this. The white folks, former Confederates, they're just going to wait it out. They're going to wait out, okay, there's troops here, and then, yeah, there's African Americans voting and being elected, but they're going to sit back and just be patient. Eventually, you know, the attention's going to go away from these states, and we're going to come back in, we're going to do our thing. You look at it that way. Also, the country's focus on reconstructions in a way because some other really significant events are going to occur that is going to take people's attention away from Reconstruction and worrying about civil rights of former slaves in the South. And the, first is the Republican supermajorities are going to unravel. And what's really, really, really going to help that is two things. First is the Panic of 1873. When you see the word panic, it's not like everybody panics for a couple of days because the economy's bag, bag, back and everything comes back to normal. A panic is a depression. That means that the the economy and its fundamentals and its system 
is in a panic. That means it's not operating well. It's operating in a way, what happens is the things go bad and then the stock market and then the money supply, everything starts to go out of whack. That's a panic. It hurt the country severely. It's one of the most deepest depressions in the history of the country. And the Republican goals in the South, okay, are going to go with it. The Republicans are not going to focus on what the South needs because, A, it costs money. When you have a panic, you have less revenue to the government to be able to pay for things. Plus, you're focusing on the economy. Okay? So during a panic, what caused this panic was the overbuilding of the railroads for the most part. A lot of these railroads are starting to grow too fast too soon. A lot of them collapsed and that, that started the whole thing. Also, the stories of corruption hurt the Republican Party really, really bad. Now, just so you know, Grant will be reelected in 1872 because of his popularity. Okay? But the Republican Party is going to start to split. You're going to have the disillusioned liberals. Now, when you hear the word liberal, you might be thinking liberal in a 2018 context. Liberal meaning progressive. That means a liberal that, you know, usually supports larger government and, uh, you know, more regulation in the economy and more taxes, the rich kind of stuff. Well, classic liberalism of the 19th century is the exact opposite. So understand the definition of what we use for liberal, like liberal Democrat versus classical or classic liberalism are the exact opposite. So the Republican Party split into different factions. The liberal Republicans, led by Horace Greeley, who was a publisher, I think of the New York, not the Post, it was, I don't know what it is, the Herald, some newspaper. He advocated laissez-faire, that means a government policy that leaves private businesses alone and let them grow and let them regulate and also have a very small federal government. Now, the radicals, the radical Republicans were kind of the opposite. They wanted to put money into internal improvements and they wanted to have federal programs to help the freedmen, okay? That's larger government. Remember, the Republican Party came together in 1854. Most of the new Republicans were former Whigs. Remember the American system under Henry Clay? Invest a lot of money in your ports and roads and canals, okay? That was part of the Republican platform, the establishment Republicans at the time. That government expenditures uh, from the federal government is a good thing and also engage business. Don't be laissez-faire. I know I'm going over this a lot, but the next couple chapters is going to become really defined. The Republicans are going to split and so are the Democrats. Okay. Another scandal, the Credit Mobiler scandal, where the Union Pacific Railroad Company cre created fake or bogus contracts to make money. And who got a lot of that money? Members of Congress or people that were connected that gave a lot of money to members of Congress in their campaigns. And understand, back in the 1870s, guys, there were virtually no campaign finance laws. That means if you raised 50 grand for your election and you only spent 10, you can use that 40 grand for whatever you wanted. Today, you can't do that. You raise money. It's only certain expenditures allowed. You have to report everything. That wasn't the case back then, guys. It was pretty much a free-for-all. Okay? So it was very much easier to corrupt government, but they still get corrupted today. They just find new ways around the laws. Members of Congress and Grant's vice president accepted bribes from this credit mobile or a company to scandal these fake contracts. This member of Congress knew about it. They knew they were fake. Well, shut them up. Give them bribes. Here, take this cash from the bag. Shut up. Okay. Then there was the whiskey ring where government officials were creating false tax reports. Why? So then they could be able to um, get away with all kinds of corrupt things. If the tax reports were false, um, there's ways that you can move money around. And notably, Secretary of War William Belknap accepted bribes in this whole whiskey ring. 
So yeah, not good. And I'll say this. When any political party has overwhelming majorities, their power is not held in check. And what happens, guys, historically, is corruption and scandals like this. Look at the state governments of like Rhode Island, where former speakers and majority leaders are in prison for for taking bribes and money. Okay, Look at Massachusetts. The last three Massachusetts speakers of the House have gone to jail or been indicted. Okay for wrongdoing. Both states are heavily one-party states. I won't get into the politics, Republican versus Democrat. As you know, Massachusetts and in, in, in uh, Rhode Island are heavily Democratic states. I'm not saying it has anything to do with the party per se. Some of you may think it does or doesn't. But when you have one party with super, super majorities like the Congress in the 1870s, and then, you know, the Grant administration, because he's Grant, nobody's going to... It, it's just... It, it's a mess. Okay. So there's going to be a counter-revolution in the South of these Redeemer governments. They want to redeem, bring back what was there. They want to redeem these bad decisions and bad things brought in by these Republican military governments. Local and state governments that ousted Republican governments... Those are the redeemers. Get rid of those Republicans. Let's redeem our state. Get To get rid of this infection of Republicans. And even to add worse to it, many of these Republican voters are former slaves and blacks. Oof. Okay? I'm just characterizing um, the attitude. It's probably a lot worse than what I'm saying, unfortunately. It was often done through violence and intimidation. So how do you oust these Republicans? Well, there's going to be a group that's going to arise after the Civil War called the Ku Klux Klan. Known as the KKK. Okay? They were basically the terrorist arm of the Democrat Party domestically for years. Starting in the 1860s up until through the Civil Rights Movement of the 50s. Okay? Um, Historically, the the KKK were former Confederates that became part of this group. To scare people and even at some points intimidate and harm and or kill people in order to to oust these Republican governments and and redeem these state governments. Um, The Klan, they're they're pretty nasty. Usually during tough economic times, we're going to see them rise up and down again and again in American history. Um, They terrorize blacks and Republicans. And the reason they wear the white hoods, they want to resemble the ghosts of the former Confederates that were killed in the Civil War. That's why they wear the white hoods and the white suits. I like to think that they wear the white hoods so that because they're cowards and they don't want to be seen. They want to be secretive of their hate. Um, I'll be. I'll, I'm very rarely going to be biased, guys. When it comes to haters and racists and stuff, I'm pretty biased against them. I hope you're not offended by that. <laughs> you know, just just trying to be a little funny here. I think everyone agrees when it comes to racists and haters. Um, we don't like that. So when they wear their hoods like cowards, I'm going to call them a coward. So there's my bias of the day. Um, The Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871, they're going to look good on paper, guys. It's a response to the KKK. Okay, how do... do, Because the state governments aren't doing anything. Remember, these these KKK uh, groups are trying to bring back white Democrats into power in the state governments. So as they're coming into power, you think they're going to um, put a clamp down on the KKK? No. So the federal government could now prosecute criminals of federal law. Well courts are going to come in and say you can't do that so there's going to be an attempt to deal with the kkk because the state governments are looking the other way why because they're benefiting from their terrorization of blacks and republicans everybody see that the states are going to look the other way like what who's the kkk i don't know what you're talking about how about if i said this a lot of the elected officials that are going to be part of the redeemer governments are members of the clan you see the thing? So the federal government, the Republicans in Washington, are going to try to do something about this because they know the state governments aren't going to do anything about it. Under this, too, the president could use the military to protect individual rights. 
this stuff is going to be shot down by the courts. So the reconstruction is going to be rolled back. Democrats will gain control of the United States House of Representatives in 1874. Two reasons. The panic of 1873 is going to go on for a while. Awful economy. That usually hurts the party in power. Secondly, the scandals. Credit Mobler, the whiskey ring, and other stuff. Okay, The Democrats are going to come back strong. Also, there's going to be... Um, a lot of uh, southern states remitted into the Union. It's going to take them a little while to get their act together. But they're going to elect more. Um, as the Redeemers become successful in these states, chipping away at African-American power and Republican power in these states, more and more Democrats are going to get elected, not just in the state legislative level, but at the congressional level. Most of the country, including the Grant administration, was no longer concerned with the South. Why? They had, uh, this is horrible. But they had bigger fish to fry. They're worried about the economy, feeding their families, putting a roof over the head, not facing economic ruin, okay, and trying to find a way to get a, either get away with the scandals they're being caught with or, okay, with the Democrats, they're going to be concerned about making sure it's pinned on the Republicans so they can take away their seats. So the, the North, let's look at the North and the country, is not focused on... They might care that African Americans are having a bad, but they don't care as much as them not being able to feed themselves. Everybody see that? The Supreme Court will reject these equal right laws and things that are being passed. Even they're going to really, let's just say, I'll say it, disingenuously interpret the intent of the Civil Rights Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So in in the case, the U.S. versus uh, uh, Crickshank, the court ruled that only state violations of individual rights were a concern, not individual rights themselves. So if the state violates it, that's the only concern. That means the state government. But they're not really concerned in their rulings of individual rights like what we have in the Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. Then you add in political rights that are being guaranteed in the 14th and 15th Amendments. Equal protection under the laws to right to vote regardless of your color and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Then you have the civil rights ca- cases. That, uh, there's, a, there's a series of them that basically essentially said that the 14th Amendment did not prevent private discrimination. Only government discrimination. So equal protection of the laws is only when individuals are dealing with the government. Not with a private railroad. Not with um, a private business. Not with dealings between one private citizen and another private citizen. Only when people are being discriminated when they're dealing with government. Everybody see that? Well... Most of the discrimination in the society, guys, does that have to do with the government or does it have to do with day-to-day with people, companies, and at the local level? Not, this has nothing to do with government. Everybody see this? So they're, they're kind of reinterpreting these laws to kind of skate around it. And because out of the nine members of the Supreme Court, I believe five or six of them had sympathies to the South or was outright Southerners. Not saying that being a southern was bad, but I'm just letting you know that the court became kind of politicized here in not supporting the reconstruction efforts, and they were more on mm, the southern persuasion on how to look at these civil rights uh, amendments and laws. So the political crisis of 1877, okay, in 1876 is going to be a presidential election. You have Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be the Republican candidate. Of course, Grant's not going to run for re-election. He's getting up there. Um, all the scandals, two terms, you know. He, he, you know, Washington, you serve two terms and leave. Um, so Hayes, I think, I don't know if he was the governor or the senator from Ohio, either or. He's going to be the Republican nominee. And then Samuel Tilden the governor of New York will be the Democrat nominee. Now understand, Democrats still have a tightrope to walk. 
You have to make people in the North happy. He's from New York. Their interests are different, essentially, than the interests of the South, the former Confederate States. He's got that tightrope to walk. Okay? So, Tilden, actually, is going to receive, after the voting, of the votes are counted, 184 electoral votes. He needed 185 to win the presidency. Remember, you have to win 50% plus one of the electoral votes in order to be elected president. It has nothing to do with the popular vote. We will say that Tilden had a pretty substantial lead in the popular vote, too. He needed one more electoral vote. It was 184 to 165. Okay? That means Tilden needed one. Hayes needed 20. There were 20 electoral votes in dispute. Now, you think for the guy that had a huge lead in the popular vote, you think maybe one of those electoral votes could be deemed for Hayes? I mean, for Tilden? I would think so. But let's look at what was going on. When there's a tie or not enough votes to go, it goes to the House of Representatives. What they decided to do, the problem was 20 votes were in dispute and were not brought forth to the Electoral College to be declared. So instead of having the House of Representatives take it on fully, a commission was appointed equally divided between Democrats and Republicans, and these were all the power brokers of both parties, to decide what, and help decide what to do with those 20 disputed electoral votes. But when they got together, they started to compromise. They looked at the big picture, the big political picture. Unfortunately for Sam Tilden, they didn't look at for the picture of a President Tilden. They looked at a bigger picture the Democrats in particular, what was best for their party. And the one thing that they really needed in order to move along as a party is to end Reconstruction one way or another. So this Compromise of 1877 will give all 20 of those disputed electoral votes to Hayes and make him president. Okay, so if you're a Tilden, you've been, I'll say, you've been screwed. But why did his own Democrats screw him? Well, what did they get out of what is known the Compromise of 1877? I don't have it written down here. You should read this and know this and know this well. Hayes is given the presidency for the short-term goal of the Republicans having the White House. Well, the Democrats, I think, were kind of smart. They're going to look at, okay, we've got to end Reconstruction and bring back Democrat power into the South. And in the long term, who's going to be able to benefit from that? The Democrats will in the long term. In the long term. Not necessarily the short term, but the long term. So how does this work? What did the Democrats get? First, the military is withdrawn from the South. Those five districts now are going to be done. The, the, the five military districts that were put in under Congressional Reconstruction, gone. With that, if there's no troops forcing or protecting African Americans, protecting the Republicans in government, who's going to take over, guys? The Democrats are going to walk in. Those Redeemers are going to take full control very quickly. The second thing is, is that the Republicans agreed to put a couple Democrats into the cabinet particularly Postmaster General, which gives out a lot of federal jobs. Third, the Republicans agreed that they're going to do some internal improvements in the South, some canals, ports, railroads, work, that kind of stuff, to help rebuild the economy. And what do, do, do the Republicans get? They keep the White House. They've had the White House. They're going to keep the White House. Um... The last Republican, I believe, well, Democrat, you can't really count Johnson, was James Buchanan before Abraham Lincoln. So that's going give, to give them, again, a 20-year hold in the White House, but not necessarily. It's going to give them another four years, too, when Garfield gets elected in 1800. And then finally, Grover Cleveland, uh, a Democrat, will take it in 1884. So there is the importance of the compromise of 1877. It ends Reconstruction. 
the troops are taken out. The only reason that the Republicans, were, you can look at it this way, guys. The only reason the Republicans and, uh, and African Americans were in power is because there were troops to force it. The white former Confederates resisted this. And as soon as those troops went in, they stepped in and took everything back and took the power back of the state and local governments. Okay? So I know I'm going over it quite a bit. You need to understand how profound this compromise of 1877 was. Tilden should have won that. You're trying to tell me there wasn't one vote. But again, the Democrats were smart. They're playing long game. They're playing long ball. They're playing long term. Republicans weren't. And if you actually look at the parties today, you can really look at it. Over the last 30 years, Republicans have always played the short term. Democrats play the long game. We'll talk more about this as we look at uh, the 20th century and the 21st century. um, Because that's where we're going. Okay? That, um, That sketch right there, that is in a frame on my wall in my classroom, you can go and look at it. That's Sam Tilden with two faces. Why? Remember I talked about that impossible job trying to keep Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats together would make them two-faced. Okay? There was a criticism of him. The guy on the bottom, I think that's his running mate. I forgot his name. His last name I think was Hendricks. It was Tilden Hendricks. They make him as a little baby. There's an inflation balloon there. There's all kinds of problems there. But, I mean, just from a standpoint politically, you got to feel bad for Sam Tilden. He got, he really got shafted in the in the 1876 election with that compromise. Um, talk about someone that should have been president, Sam Tilden. And there's the map. Red is a Republican, uh, blue is a uh, Democrat. Understand, New England was a de- is going to be a Republican state from 1860 all the way. Um, to probably um, the 1930s will start to switch the other way. Long time. Lasting legacies. Although blacks still faced unbelievably harsh conditions, life was mostly better than the antebellum era, the era before the Civil War. The right to marry, be educated, and travel all came to be for former slaves. Before they couldn't marry, they didn't want them to be able to read and write. You can't travel because you're a slave. You you only travel when they let you. Although the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were restricted in the short term, they would later be used to uphold civil rights. You can almost look look at those three amendments as a seed that will blossom later. Unfortunately for African Americans that lived during that time, 80 years later. So some of them never really saw uh, the real freedoms that that were planted in those, uh, that were seeded in those amendments. And the civil rights would be in the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movement, and which really gets started with the case, um, the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. We'll spend a lot of time on that this year. So a quick review, presidential versus congressional reconstruction. You need to know the differences. Presidential, the two presidents, Lincoln, Johnson. Congressional reconstruction, it's going to evolve from Republicans to control of radical Republicans. And eventually there's going to be a split with the Republicans that's going to eventually mean that the Democrats will take over in 1874. And eventually an election of 1876 leads to the compromise 1877. You need to know that kind of stuff. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 is congressional reconstruction that in, it puts in place a more harsher reconstruction based on military power, five military districts, okay, forcing reconstruction um, to push Congress's will. It ends up being a failure. 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, also known as the Civil Rights Amendments. Again, that's the seed. They'll be planted the 1860s and 70s, that 80 years later, in the 1950s and 60s, will be the basis and the genesis for the civil rights movement that I would say is still going on. Splitting women's rights movement over the 15th Amendment is important. Okay? And also is a good uh, case study of what is practical in politics. 
even though you, you look at women not being able to vote, you can look at it, that was wrong. But politics is the art of the possible. The Freedmen's Bureau, first federal relief program, basically. It's, it's successes and failures. Sharecropping, a necessary system under the conditions. It wasn't forced upon, but that's what happens. Economic arrangements happen based on conditions. Sharecropping is a good example of that. Conditions were not really any land redistribution. You have former slaves. They needed to survive. What do you do? Land needs to be used from the people who own the land. People need to work. The redemption governments, man, they were just waiting off the clock. A lot of these white Democrat Southerners, former Confederates, they're just waiting off the clock. Okay, eventually these Republicans are going to give up and they're going to leave. We'll come and redeem everything. And let's, let's push the process a little bit further. Let's put on white you know, hoods and stuff and start terrorizing blacks and Republicans to speed up the process. I know that's a, you know, kind of a, not a cliche, but a interesting way to look at it. But you can look at it that way. And that is it. Now, there's, I didn't cover every single thing in the chapter. And remember, you know, on the exam... Um, the AP exam, there'll be a lot of things. It's your responsibility to read, notate. I had you on this chapter do um, the Cornell style notes to really notate all these things. We're gonna we're gonna go over a lot of stuff. But the reading and these lectures, you have to do both, guys. Don't just listen to my lectures and get away with the reading. If so, I'm telling you, your grade or your overall success on the exam is gonna be completely um I don't know. It's not going to be good. I don't know what the right word for it is. If you have specific questions or you don't think I explained something well here or didn't go over something in the book that's important, that's when we ask questions in class. I am not going over this again in class. You need to ask the questions when you're taking the notes. If you're not sure about something, you can either fire me an email or ask during class. And believe me, I'll ask it. Any other questions on this chapter on, on these readings? It is up to you to know what you understand and don't understand, and I'll be able there to help facilitate that. We are going to be spending our time in class working on the skills, the reading, the writing, the talking about history, the the acting like a historian, using the tools, the historian's toolbox, okay, and being able to do that um, in a very effective way. So when you take this exam, you're going to have no problem on this, but you have to do the work at home. So until the next chapter, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in school. Thank you very much.